How's everybody feeling? Good? All right. I, we, we have some more people coming because, you know, timing is weird. Um, but I, I really hope that you all had a wonderful lunch. Um, hope you guys had a chance to meet some new people, um, while, whether you were at the, the attendee lunch or the glass door lunch. And all the people uh, participating virtually, hope you used the app and started chatting with people and got to new, know a few new people. Um, so, so we're refueled. And now it's time to jump into the first session of the afternoon. So let me set the stage a little bit. D-E-I-B, diversity, equity, inclusion, and you'll learn about the B in a few minutes. But it's a four-letter acronym that has somehow become a four-letter word. That isn't the case at Indeed, and it really shouldn't be at any of your companies either, at least not if you want to attract the best talent. That's what we're going to talk about in the next session. To start, my friend Jessica Hardiman, who leads attraction and engagement for Indeed, uh, will offer her perspective from the place from where many of you sit, the talent acquisition seat. Over the past couple of years, DEI has become this political hot button topic, but she's gonna talk about why it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. And then after her, her intro commentary, she'll be joined by Rajkumari Niogi, CEO at I Belong, to discuss why DEI isn't just a nice to have, but is a business imperative, especially in times right now. So please allow me to welcome Jessica Hardiman to the Wonderwork stage. <laughs> Thank you, Marquise. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm like LaFon, good afternoon. All right. Um, you know, DEI is the latest term to become highly politicized, and many organizations are in a frenzy to quickly succumb to these external pressures. And I'm sure you've all have seen the headlines. DEI programming and staff are dropping like flies. And it seems like everyone has a hot take, like take this tech CEO. His viewpoints are counter to how we at Indeed view DEI so we've anonymized the post. He certainly doesn't need any more airtime. These hot takes held by a subset of people are deeply offensive and intentionally polarizing. Even lauded HR organizations are incorporating language and taking actions that feels like we're moving two steps back instead of progressing forward, much to many practitioners' dismay. From economic downturns causing cuts in DEI teams across the board to political measures adding pressure, it is incredibly disheartening to see DEI staff and programming get cut. And it just goes to show that many of the promises made in 2020 to bolster diversity, equity, and inclusion programming were performative at best. What we're witnessing is an overwhelmingly loud subset successfully eroding change on a global scale. But when we dig deeper, what we find is that this subset doesn't actually represent how the majority of people feel. And that's not only in the US, that's across the globe. We've seen it time and time again, uh, that people across the world think that diversity, equity, and inclusion programming is overall a good thing for companies. So, why is there such a disconnect? Let's do a quick vote here in the room, and that includes our virtual friends that are streaming as well. How many of you have had conversations or even disagreements with your colleagues about the reality of your DEI programs? How many of you feel like your company has started to de deprioritize DEI, whether that's quietly or publicly? You don't have to, you don't have to raise your hands for that one. It's okay. It's, oh, oh, okay, all right. <laughs> Today, people have weaponized the term DEI, making it almost anonymous with being black. We rarely hear about the other groups that DEI programming benefits. And many people fail to realize that these issues are systemic and they're deeply embedded in how this country operates. From who can be approved for credit to purchase a home, that's known as redlining, down to how districts are drawn in order to vote. 
Privilege is another term that has been weaponized recently. But let's take a moment to really break it down. Defined, privilege is unearned access or advantages uh, granted to specific groups of people because of their membership in a social group. That means it can be based on a variety of social identities, such as race, gender, religion, socioeconomic status, ability status, sexuality, age, education level, and more. Privilege can be experienced on a personal, on an interpersonal, or an institutional level. It's not something that should be used to hurt or harm. It simply is. What truly matters is that we start to treat it like a superpower instead of another four-letter word. However, in order to activate your privilege or your newfound superpower, you have to accept its existence, name it, and only then can it be used for good. Are you advocating for those that may not be in the room or have a seat at the table? How many people and how are you inviting people and enabling the voices in the room that aren't otherwise there or heard? I, for one, consider myself privileged to have been able to attend college without incurring enormous debt. That's undergrad and grad school. Thank you, Marsha. Hopefully she's watching. Further, as a black woman, I consider myself privileged that both of my parents and my maternal grandparents, grandparents, excuse me, were able to attend college. You see, once I recognized my privilege, I made sure to dedicate myself to ensuring others had the support they needed to have access to the education or the job that they wanted. As I've gotten older, I realize that the ability to attend college isn't connected to the ability to do or get a job. So I was able to incorporate those things into my roles. So in my current role, my team is responsible for launching the first internal technical apprenticeship program at Indeed, where we take non-technical Indeedians, so Indeedians that are in non-technical roles like sales, we reskill them and we're helping them get placed on an Indeed engineering team. Helping job seekers facing barriers through intentional programming is now literally a part of my role. Specificity is also incredibly important. At Indeed, we define what DEI means in our organization. In 2022, we renamed our internal team to include diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, or DEIB+, with the plus symbol as a special commitment. It acknowledges that there's more to this work that beats the eye, and it is our reminder to remain agile and consider the various perspectives and lived experiences as we inform our approach. When we intentionally design teams with diverse backgrounds, perspectives, capabilities, we foster an innovative workplace and we gain an overall competitive advantage. By prioritizing representation, maintaining a rigorous talent management process, we're building equity into our products, we're strengthening our organization, and we're improving the future of work. Our commitment to, to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging extends beyond our employees' experiences, and it is embedded into our products, into our platforms, and how we show up in our communities. DEI is not meant to be divisive. DEI is not only considerate of one person's or one group's experience. DEI is not meant to exclude, to minimize, or disregard. DEI is not optional. Everyone must see themselves in this work. Take this recent clip from an internally produced skills hiring promotion. When I got to community college, I 
just didn't have the good setup for doing well at school. I kind of just assumed that without a degree, I wasn't really able to kind of go much higher than like store manager, right? When I got out of the military, what I kept finding was that they want an HR degree or they want a business degree, and I didn't have any of that. I immediately knew that the answer was to seek out the skills that I wanted to develop. Like right now, I'm learning ETL testing. Had no idea what that was two months ago, but I saw it for another job, thought it was interesting, and now I'm learning about it. Someone took a chance on me and saw something on me that like I have trouble seeing in myself. I tell my team all the time, like, I'm just happy to be here. When organizations are deciding to hire skills first, they're acknowledging that the world is changing in these really critical ways. I think if employers can focus on paring down job descriptions to really what is essential to do the job, they'll find that they're opening up that talent pool to a different set of skill sets and more candidates that are probably closely aligned to the job. So I think it's really important to find people who have you know, the skills, but also find people who are super motivated to work hard, to, to constantly learn, to constantly push themselves. They've gone through different things in their lives, their journey has been a bit different, but they shouldn't be excluded because of that. You know, they might actually have like something really valuable to add be because of that, yeah. These are the kinds of intersectional stories that we need to bring to the forefront as we continue to build a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive world of work. The undeniable reality is that diversity, equity, and inclusion help your bottom line. Companies that stay true to their beliefs and commitments to DEI, even as public dialogue evolves, will attract and retain top talent who are dedicated to advancing the company's goals. Shout out to Mark Cuban, a Dallasite who gets it. And he's absolutely right. That's all right, you can shout out Mark Cuban, go ahead. <laughs> he's right, the loss of DEI-phobic companies will ultimately be his gain. And it's also clear that Mark Cuban has done his research. There are countless studies that prove that diversity, and, uh, diversity has a positive impact um, on your company's performance. McKinsey, the World Economic Forum, and many more lauded research institutions have proven time and time again that a more diverse workforce will increase an organization's success. This is further as it evidenced by research that proves that diverse teams make better decisions, period. When the diversity of your team increases, so does the quality of your output, with teams that have age, gender, race, and ethnic diversity outperforming the rest. Through our own work well-being research, we've also found that greater employee well-being is tied to higher company valuation, higher return on assets, and greater profits. And guess what some of the top drivers are for work well-being? Inclusion and belonging. The proof is in the pudding, and yet globally we're falling short of these key drivers. Immediately following this session, you'll hear more about our work well-being research from Jan Emmanuel Deneve, Professor of Economics and Director of the Wellbeing Research Center at the University of Oxford. So, where do we go from here? What are some tangible actions that can be taken? At the highest level, we need a systematic, scalable, and intentional approach that is resonant across generations, across backgrounds, and across identities. Above all, we have to start with people. Have you spent any time with your employees and counterparts to discover what their experiences are to identify the gaps? We are all individuals who make up te a team and can have influence on our respective organizations. We can leverage our collective experiences to develop inclusive, equitable programs, policies, and processes. But it's people that should always be the starting point when attempting to solve where you are as an organization. It's people over everything. After our Indeedians, we go directly to our programs, policies, and processes to make our initiatives scalable and future-proof. 
ask your teams, what are specific initiatives that you currently have in place and how intersectional are they? Let's use this era of tumult to recalibrate. Let's test our DEI programming against internal and third party benchmarks and identify what has worked and what is primed for failure. And if there are no benchmarks currently in place, now is a great time to create some. Ask yourselves, what are you doing to advocate to maintain and or bolster DEI. At Indeed, we have published externally specific 2030 ESG goals that influence our DEIB plus initiatives. Every year, we also publish our own DEIB plus report that includes our most up-to-date workforce demographics for the current year and year-over-year -year benchmark progress reporting. Through this report, We've also been able to document some really promising employee-driven initiatives. Our iPride and Gender Identity Inclusion Business Resource Group, or IBRG, conceptualized and led the establishment of Indeed's Gender Affirming Care Benefit, a $10,000 stipend for US-based employees who need to move away from a jurisdiction or state that has passed laws limiting access to gender-affirming services. Our Parents and Caregivers IBRG played a foundational role in expanding our caregiver leave policies to encompass not just child care, but the care of other family members, including parents, step-parents, spouses, domestic partners, uncles, aunts, and more. If we solve for the most marginalized, we're actually creating solutions for everyone. We are continually assessing and improving fairness in our workplace at Indeed. However, we're also empowering our employees to make an impact based on their own experiences. Of course, we're still learning and iterating at Indeed as well. It's next to impossible to get everything right the first time, or sometimes the second. Maybe it takes a third. For example, our performance enablement process through a DEIB partnership, we incorporated upward feedback through a pilot program in order to ensure all voices are heard and that managers are accountable for supporting an inclusive work environment, leveraging direct employee feedback to continuously improve. Especially since some won't always be comfortable with raising issues with their managers or their skip levels. And now upward feedback is firm wide. It also helps bolster psychological safety among employees and helps to ensure a fact-based review process. These three takeaways are to help guide you as you're iterating on your DEI strategies. Reminders. First, start with your people. Remember, it's people over everything. Second, get really specific about your programming. And finally, review your DEI benchmarks. Especially in this current political climate, now is the time to take action. Like my friend and colleague LaFon says, you have to decide as a business leader at this moment, what side of history do I want to be on? And now I'm excited to invite Rajkumari Niyogi to the stage to help us dig a little deeper. Welcome, Rajkumari. Hello, Jessica. That was fantastic. Oh, thank you. So, Rajkumari, yes. along with being a dear friend and oh. colleague, um, Raj Kamari is also the CEO of I Belong, which is a platform offering on-demand resources for workplaces dedicated to building inclusive and resonant cultures. Focusing on neurobiology, culture, and empathy, Raj Kamari combines scientific prowess and resonant language to reimagine leadership. Did that capture? It was wonderful. Okay, that's all right. That's all right. Okay. 
So Raj Kamari, <clears throat> your journey to becoming a thought leader and promoting psychological safety at work and coaching leaders to thrive is so, so inspiring to me. Aww. And not just because you help me as well. <laughs> Aww, totally straight. Can you share a little bit about your personal story and what kind of set you down this path? Absolutely, thank you. You know, I spent some time at a tech company that you all know, two and a half years. <laughs> And I loved my boss there. I loved what I did there. And over the course of time, what I started to notice was that I didn't feel as welcome. And then it started to get really uncomfortable. So I did what many of us do, and I quit. And I went off to Southeast Asia and ate a ton of noodles. And then many I started- of us, Many of us do that. <laughs> right, many of us do that. <laughs> and I started to do some research around, so what was I feeling exactly, because it didn't, feel great. Mm -hmm. And that's where I stumbled on this word that you may have heard of, exclusion. And I was like, wait, what? There's this thing? And there is so much research around exclusion and how that impacts how I show up at work. And so I thought, holy moly cannoli, let me go build a company, because <laughs> Silicon Valley, and, and see if anyone else is interested in, in learning about this. That's amazing. And I think something I want to specifically point out is that you were able to name the thing, right? And yeah. most of the time, that's half of the battle is figuring out what the thing is so you can name it and then, you know, dive into it. So I, I love that. Um, that's a good point, actually. <laughs> I Belonging's mission is to uplevel humanity's consciousness by shifting collective trauma. Yeah. How has this work shaped your views on the future of DEI as a whole, especially considering the political challenges these initiatives are facing today? You know, I think that we are not talking about something in this conversation about belonging. Okay. And that is epigenetics. Epigenetics is really the stress that we experience every day. We experience stress in conversations, going to meetings, just having life. And when we start to understand how that is shaping our levels of engagement, then we start to understand that that is impacting our leadership styles. Mm. And so how we start to connect with others and find this place of building a bridge, especially in moments of conflict, especially in moments of tension or anxiety, and being able to really utilize that to gain clarity. I think that's really important. I love that, and I'm gonna, that leads nicely to my next question is like, I know you've worked with a ton of different organizations, we won't mm -hmm. name them, but how do you adapt your methodology to fit all these different company cultures, especially when they may be more resistant to DEI? I mean, like every conversation, there's inquiry, right? I think there's a great book by Edgar Schein called Humble Inquiry. And doing discovery conversations is mm -hmm. so essential. And then tailoring it, identifying what the pain points are. They're gonna be different for every company. Ultimately though, it comes down to communication and collaboration. So what's preventing that? What's impeding that? Because that's gonna impact your bottom line. That's gonna impact you innovating. So how do you start to really kind of dig deep into this humble inquiry and get really curious about what's going on for your workforce? So moving on kind of down the path past the inquiry, yeah. right? Um, a lot of your work at I Belong focuses on emotional intelligence and psychological safety, right? Mm -hmm. But how do these elements intersect with DEI? Being able to really understand what's going on for your people. How many have you have gone to a meeting and the person across the Zoom call or even in person has asked you about your weekend, asked you about your sick child, mm -hmm. asked you about your dying parent? In that moment, how do you feel? Do you feel acknowledged, witnessed, valued, appreciated? Do you feel seen? That is the way that we begin to tailor how we connect. The foundation of care needs to uphold the values of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. 
So let's take that thread all the way through. How can our practitioners in the room, what are some practical steps that folks in the room can do to foster these qualities in their own workplaces? I think looking at the opportunity right now to really take conflict and turn it into connection. Mm. How are you seeing your anxiety? How are you seeing your fear? How are you seeing yourself hesitant or avoidant to approach someone? What is your opportunity to lean into that conversation and get curious and start to bridge the gap in a way that will allow you to connect even deeper? I love that, turning conflict into connection. I think conflict creates anxiety, but when you kind of reframe it, we're thinking about strategies to connect with people differently, right? With opposing yeah. viewpoint, maybe. Yeah, exactly. And really, really take that opportunity to maybe build a relationship that might look different after that conversation. 100%. Yeah, I 100%. love that. Um, I kind of talked about all the political stuff that's going yeah. on right now against DEI. What are some practical steps organizations can take in order to stay committed to their DEI initiatives? The bottom line at the end of the day is, are you prioritizing the dignity of your workforce? Are you prioritizing care? Jessica talks about people over everything. Where are you on that spectrum? And your workforce will tell you exactly where you are. Getting curious around the surveys or the engagement metrics, where are the places in which you need to improve? Where are you finding the impediments? Where are you hearing in ER conversations, employee relations conversations, that there are the problems, the issues? The invitation is to focus and turn toward that to create that level of understanding. So it's one thing to stay committed to, yeah. your, to your initiatives, right? To your DEI commitments. But how can we ensure that it's not performative and it's in truly embedded into the fabric of the organization? That's a question to, to really ask the leaders. When we start to really understand what's happening as a leader, I think when we don't find ourselves standing in a place of certainty, then we need to grasp towards finding places where we can gain control. And I think there's an opportunity here with working with the leadership of the organization to really start to uncover where there are gaps in accountability, where there are gaps in being able to take feedback, for example, and to be able to receive that and to show up for the teams and the workforces that allow people to step into a place of true engagement. You know, when we are wired to belong, we are wired to connect. And the ways in which we show up determine how our nervous system is gonna react mm -hmm. to the work that we're doing. So how are you creating spaces for people to show up and make mistakes? How are you inviting people to really double down in accountability and to really double down in being able to take the risks to have those difficult conversations mm -hmm. and to share the feedback that needs to be said. Can I probe a little bit? You talked about how we're wired kind of impacts how we show up. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Like, what does that mean? What does that mean and how, how can it show up in how we show up. Yeah, well, if we find ourselves stressed, if we find ourselves fearful of having a difficult conversation, then our nervous systems start to shut down in different ways or react in different ways. And being able to invite people to have a way or a place or a space to actually share what's going on and to use the language that invites that forward is so essential. So much of how we show up at work is transactional. I need this from you and I've got to give this to you, right? 
and how we don't spend enough time really holding the human aspects of who we are, I think is so essential. If we think about how we speak, our, our left hemisphere speaks differently than our right hemisphere. And as organizations, we prioritize transactional ways of speaking. And the invitation at I Belong is to invite workforces to start to speak from a more relational aspect of, of who we are. When, when you look at organizations, what makes your company great are your people. Mm -hmm. And what makes your people great are the relationships that they have with each other. So how are you fostering these relationships? Everyone's nervous system is different. Everyone's gonna react to feedback differently. And how are you encouraging and enlightening and learning them about themselves, mm -hmm. creating that awareness for who they are and how they can connect with their teams at a deeper level. Speaking of being able to kind of show up as who you are and, and how we see ourselves, intersectionality, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, the multiple various identities that we all, all have and, and understand, what role does intersectionality have in creating DEI programs and how can organizations make sure that they're inclusive of all identities? I think that's really important. I mean, when you talk about intersectionality, you're talking about demographics for sure, right? But how would you speak to a 60-year-old veteran mm -hmm. versus a 27-year-old um, millennial, right? You would speak very differently. Even though you need to get the work done, there's an opportunity to tailor the language. How do you speak to your parents versus your kids? Mm -hmm. How do you speak to your friends? versus people who are in different countries um, that are friends of yours, right? I know that I start to kind of even change my voice when I'm speaking to Europeans versus when I'm speaking to people in Asia. It's just an, a natural thing for me to do. But the ways in which we can start to understand the, the, the nuances of our team, who they are, what they're bringing to the table, that is their intersectionality. And how can you leverage that for your own benefit? Mm -hmm. As you learn who your teams are across the business, then you can find out where you have gold mines that are existing. I think that's really important. I love that. I'm gonna look at the other side of things now. So as a DEI practitioner myself, I know we have DEI practitioners in the audience and watching. What advice would you give us who are facing burnout exhaustion, all the things, due to the current happenings of the world, the political my goodness, climate. <laughs> my goodness, my goodness. Well, let's just take a breath given that, right? As we think about what's happening in the world, there is just so much. When you're exhausted, you might think about going to get a massage. When you're exhausted, you might think about going away for the weekend. When you're exhausted, you might think of triaging that exhaustion. And that's great. I recommend it 100%. What we don't do enough as practitioners is we don't ritualize our care. Mm. We need to really understand that who we are as humans is in fact about being cared for and to care, to be cared for and to care for others. And so caring for yourself is absolutely critical. The ways in which you show up for you in your day to day, mm -hmm. how do you set that up? I coach leader, leaders in every field, in every industry, and the number one thing I say is, are you putting 15 minutes on your calendar in the morning and in the afternoon? And I get ridiculed, I get pushed back, I get laughed at 100%, and then they do it. Mm -hmm. I once had a head of sales um, tell me that she has a popsicle moment. And I was like, okay, I need to know more about that. <laughs> and she literally goes out on her deck when it's sunny and has a popsicle. And she said, because it drips, it focuses her to not use her laptop. So what's your popsicle moment? Mm. How are you creating popsicle moments every day? Because triaging is exhausting. We know you know, emergency response teams in the hospitals and how they have to contend with that. Don't become that. Mm -hmm. And if you're already there, 
slow down, rest, and start to figure out what you need in order to care for yourself. It's the oxygen mask metaphor. Mm -hmm. And there is value to that metaphor. I love that. I hope y'all wrote that down. Ritualize your care. I tell my team, do something that brings you joy every day. I and I think the way you worded it is much more profound, but same concept, right? Is what are you doing for yourself? Ritualize your joy. Yeah. Yes. Ritualize your joy. I love that. Combine them. I love Com it. You know, because that's <laughs> going to make you care about you. Yeah. When your nervous system is going to shift so dramatically when you actually ritualize mm -hmm. your joy, 100%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, last question. As a leader in this space, what inspires you to keep advocating for DEI despite all the challenges? You know, that's a... That's a it's a lot of big questions. <laughs> I am someone who really is for connection. And it's hard for me to be in a world that sometimes prioritizes harm. Mm. And there is so much harm that I witness on a daily basis. And for me, what inspires me is that hunger to figure out how to build connections with people in ways that create an understanding for each other. If we could figure out how to prioritize respect, mm. if we could figure out how to ensure that we come from a place of dignity when we engage with each other, even if the views are opposing, I have to go on Sunday and I, yes, I said I have to go on Sunday to have breakfast with my father. And I am not looking forward to that. And so for me, how do I really decide and choose to show up in a place mm. of civility, mm -hmm. dignity, and care for this man? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for spending time with us today, Raj Kamari. If you haven't, please, please check out I Belong. I work with Raj Kamari personally, and uh, the growth and development within has been monumental for me. So I appreciate you taking the time out to be at FutureWorks with us today. Um, thanks for having thank me. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for being here. <laughs>